The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Aliens will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion in their land, and an everlasting joy will be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and iniquity. In my faithfulness, I will reward them and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who then will acknowledge that they are people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me, arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself in her, her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and the garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and peace spring up before all nations. And our New Testament reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 13, 11 through 14. <clears throat> and do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissent and jealousy. Brother, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we prepare to celebrate this season. May we look past the glitz and glimmer, the hustle and bustle, and the rushing around, and focus on why we celebrate. Focus on the incarnation of your Son, who came from, to a humble beginning, to be like one of us, to go through all the trials and temptations that we go through, to identify with us as vulnerable human beings, and then to go to the cross to take the punishment that we deserve so that we can be reconciled to you. Lord, we praise you because of your great plan, your great love, and your great, your great grace that you've shown us each day. Lord, as we go out this season, may we, may we be your light in a world that is dark, in a world that is looking for something, looking for answers as to what life is about. Lord, we're thankful that you have given us the answer to this through your word and through your son. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you. Someone gave me three back. The rest of you shortchanged me. I gave you three. You gave me one back. I'm hurt. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd speak to us this morning, uh, that your Holy Spirit would speak into each and every one of our hearts exactly what we need to hear. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's Advent. How was everyone's Thanksgiving, first of all? Good. Good. Everyone's still still on that extra belt knot. See, I just got one of these belts. It's got no holes anymore. You know, it's just webbing. You just slide the thing and it clamps on. It was the best thing ever for Thanksgiving, really. 
Um, pound and a half up. All right, Charlie. Charlie's really struggling with getting his weight up, and I'm really struggling not to hate him. Um, <laughs> it's not true at all. It's not true at all. Anyway, so this is the first Sunday of Advent, as you've all deduced. We've got our candles going. Everyone's a little more alert when we got the Advent candles going because they're real fire, and this building would just go like that. So if you're, if I see you looking that way, I, it's okay. I understand. Um, so if you're not going to pay attention to me, pay attention to the candle. Um, but some of you are thrilled that Advent is upon us. You love this time of year. You, you made it past Thanksgiving. You're allowed to listen to Christmas music now. You officially have my permission. I know some of you have been listening to Christmas music for a while now, and I, that's just wrong, but um, but that's okay. Some of you can't wait to shop. Some of you can't wait. Some of the kids can't wait for the Christmas presents and cookies. And some of the adults can't wait for the Christmas presents and cookies and more cookies. And uh, and then just all of the whole thing. It's exciting. It's like today's the day. The countdown starts. I know, I know on the commercials that was like the day after Halloween. But today in the Christian calendar is the day. And so... We're going to be starting a series for Advent, and uh, and I hope you're excited about this sermon. I am. Um, you don't know what's going to be happening, um, and neither do I, because whatever happened to our videos is also happening to my iPad. Therefore, I will probably be preaching with no notes, which is always exciting to all of us. I know usually when this happens, someone comes in and goes, you know, actually, I think it was better. So maybe it'll be better. I don't know if I can control the slides either, um, but uh, yeah, I got nothing. But I think it's going to give me the notes on whatever slide you put up. So I'll let you control it, and I'll have notes or I won't. We'll just dive into it. Last year, we took a look for our Advent series at a prophecy by the prophet Isaiah that talked about who Jesus was. I mean, if we're going to be talking about Christmas coming, what's Christmas about? You know, we all say Jesus is the reason for the season. And so we talk about, well, who, according to this Isaiah prophecy, that was, is, is really a Christmas. Well, I mean, we hear it all the time around Christmas time, the one we looked at last year. The one we look at this year, we don't usually look, hear about Christmas time. Last year, we looked about who Jesus, who the Messiah was going to be and who he was and who he is. This year we're going to look at, so what is what did he come for? You know, last year if we talked about who came, this year we're going to talk about why did he come? And, and if really, if we're going to be waiting and, and anticipating and all this stuff, we, we want to really kind of get a hold of that. And so I thought, well, if we're going to kind of look at why Jesus came, it seemed to me that a good starting point would be why Jesus said he came. And if we were to turn to Luke chapter 4, 16 through 20, well, actually, let's start with Isaiah 61. Oh, look, I have notes. That's what I was going to say. If we look at this, this is the prophecy I was talking about, Isaiah 61. And there's actually... Uh, this was written during the exile. The Jews were in exile in Babylon. And actually, this whole period was kind of a rough time for them. They were actually taken captive by Babylon um, kind of in waves. There were successive rebellions. And uh, it started under Nebuchadnezzar. And he'd lead his armies against Judah. And he laid siege to Jerusalem for over a year. I don't know if anyone ever surrounded your town for over a year, not letting food go in or out or anything go in or out. Uh, it's a bummer. Um, so they didn't like that, and, and eventually um, it was successful. He killed many people. He destroyed the Jewish temple. He took captive thousands of Jews, leaving Jerusalem in ruins. And it, he, often the ones he took captive were the leaders, were the ones who would help with the rebuilding, the ones because he didn't want them to rebel again. So if you want people not to rebel, you take away their leaders, because without leaders, they usually don't do a good job of it. And so... Uh, as prophesied in Scripture, the Jewish people would be allowed to return to Jerusalem after 70 years of exile. 
And that prophecy was fulfilled in 537 BC when the Jews were allowed by King Cyrus of Persia to return to Israel and begin building the, rebuilding the city and the temple. And in the midst of all this was when the prophet Isaiah began prophesying hope. As I said, last, last Advent we looked at Isaiah chapter 9 and this prophecy of who the Messiah would be, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. Remember that one? Anyone remember the series? Okay, a couple of people remember. Actually, all right, raise your hand if you remember. Okay, because I was thinking if not, I would use it again next year, but um, <laughs> but that was ruined, so I can't. Um, anyway, in the midst of this, he begins to prophesy hope, and we looked at Isaiah 9, but now we're going to look at not who he is, but what the Son of God himself had to say about why he came. And in the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Luke chapter 4, 16 through 21, he actually quotes Isaiah 61. He uses this Isaiah prophecy to basically say, I am here and this is why. And so we're going to look at that. Now, leading into this, we're going to go through this prophecy piece by piece throughout Advent. And so I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I do need to say it because someone will discover this. Someone's going to go home and go, oh, I want to read Luke, and I'm going to read the Isaiah thing. Or you'll notice it just on the screen or something, and you'll go, hey, they're not the same. Like what Jesus read doesn't match what Isaiah 61 is in my Bible. Well, first of all, it's because it's that it never, Jesus never gets up and says, and now I'm going to read Isaiah 61. He just says, I'm going to read from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 61 is the closest to what he read, so we presume that it was Isaiah 61. It may have been something from Isaiah that was very similar that we don't have intact anymore. Or the other thing is if we go back to Isaiah 61, if you're reading it out of the Hebrew Bible versus out of the Greek Septuagint, you're going to find that those aren't like each other. I know this is very frustrating for those of you who do your quiet time in Hebrew and Greek. Um, so if you're studying Isaiah 60, you may want to just pick one or the other um, because the, the scholars haven't really come up with a truly satisfactory answer as to why these are different. Now, the, the differences are in one version, it kind of leaves out the, the restoring sight to the blind part and instead sticks in a healing the brokenhearted part. And, and there's some other differences. And, uh, you know, some people feel like, well, this, this version is more accurate than that version and this and the. Here's, here's my thing. Here's what I figured out. The Bible was inerrant as initially given. Yes, there are parts that, that are changed in all the translation. That shouldn't rock your world because there are no parts that have changed that change doctrine. I mean, it's like a word or a phrase or a turn of a phrase here and there. There are some differences. There's nothing that, that has radically changed doctrine. In fact, it's probably the most accurate ancient text in existence when you re break down and do the studies of it. Uh, so don't let that rock. It, it was when God dictated it, it was right. And so now we've got God, Jesus, God in the flesh, comes back. And, and let's take a look in Luke chapter 4. Oh, look. I've got everything now. It loaded on. This is so exciting. It's like Christmas, except it's not yet. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, and he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set those who are oppressed, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So my take on some of the differences is Jesus. There, is the, there are those who, again, say they hand, it was a Hebrew scroll and he read the Hebrew version. There are others who say, well, no, he read the Greek version. And, and here's my thing is, if the version he had wasn't right, seeing how he's God and he dictated it in the first place, he could have fixed it on the fly, right? Like if you wrote someone a letter, if I wrote Charlie a letter saying, Charlie, I really love 
that tie you wear Sunday. Now, somewhere, someone might have taken that letter and this made the mistake of saying, Charlie, I really love your ties. Now, at some point, I get up and decide I'm going to read my letter about Charlie's ties before the church. I may, I'll be reading, and, and if I'll see, Charlie, I really love your ties, I'm going to go, that's not what I wrote. I said, Charlie, I really love your tie that you wore last Sunday. And I could fix it as I read it. That's kind of what I think happened. I'm thinking, Jesus, like, this is the, this is the version I'm going with. And I'm God, so I'm allowed to. See, now, I'm not allowed to change the Bible as we go because I didn't write it. But Jesus is allowed to, to do this. Um, but that's not what, I mean, no one got freaked out about that. Even if he did change it or was accurate or whatever happened there, we just don't know. But we know that no one was like, hey, he read, that's not what it says. You know, no one said that. What freaked them out was after he read this prophecy, this famous prophecy that they were all familiar with, many of them had it memorized. He sits down and he says, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. And they're going, wait, what? This is this messianic prophecy. It's saying that, that the, it's talking about who the Messiah is going to be and what he's going to do. And he says, yeah, that's happening here and now. That's like if there is, you know, a prophecy that someone from the town of Orange would one day win the Super Bowl and... I showed up and I read it and said, that's happening this year. <laughs> yeah, that's the exact reaction I would get. But I don't think Jesus got that reaction. He was basically saying, I'm the one who's going to fulfill that. I'm the answer to that prophecy. This kind of rocked their world because this happened in Nazareth. This happened in the town he grew up in. Like, I could, I could maybe go to... I don't know, some other, I could go to St. Johnsbury and say, you know, great things about myself, and maybe they'd believe me, but if I go to Mineola, where I grew up, they'd be like, dude, we remember you in junior high. No, just no. And that's often the reaction that Jesus got. But basically, he was standing up and saying, this is why I came. This prophecy of Isaiah, this is why I came. And so we're going to start taking that apart, piece by piece, between now and Christmas. And the piece I want to look at this morning is this piece that it starts with. The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. The Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Let's look at a couple of those things. We know the Spirit, it's got a capital S. So this is talking about the Holy Spirit, one member of the Trinity. This is talking about God. Spirit of the Lord God this is how they refer to God the Father. So we've got God the Spirit, God the Father. Is upon me. Upon. What is this word? The word upon is kind of a many-faceted word. When we think about upon, we just think like it's a fancy way of saying on. But, but it's more than that. It's, it's a, the, the best thing I have is, um, anyone ever hear that Irish prayer, that Irish blessing? It goes like this. Christ with me. Christ before me, Christ behind me. Christ in me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit, Christ when I, when I stand, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in every eye that sees me, Christ in every ear that hears me. That's what upon is about. It's about the Spirit of God is ahead of me leading me and guiding me. The Spirit of God is behind me, watching my back. The Spirit of God is beneath my feet, being my support, my foundation. The Spirit of God is above me, protecting me and keeping me. The Spirit of God is within me, filling me. The Spirit of God is, is at my right hand, fighting right alongside of me. He's at my left hand, walking hand in hand. The Spirit of God is just, it, it's every degree. Upon, when you say the Spirit of God is upon me, it's, it's a big deal. It's, it's functioning within you in so many different ways. And then we have this part of, because the Lord has anointed me. Anointed. If you go back to the Old Testament, anointing happened. They would get a, a thing of oil. And, and if you remember King David, remember the Samuel, Samuel, I'm going to anoint the new king. 
And they brought his brother. He said, nah. Brought his other brother. Nah. Brought his other brother. Nah. To get cut to the chase. They get to the last one. Nah. And, and Samuel's at a loss. He's like, you got any other brothers? You know, any, any other sons? And he's like, well, we got the runt David out in the field with the sheep. But it can't be him. So he's bring him. So he brings him. He looks at David. The Spirit of God, who's upon Samuel at that point, says, that's the one I've chosen. And he anoints him as king. See, the, the people who got anointed in the Old Testament were kings and prophets. And the anointing was a sign, first of all, that they were chosen by God to work on his behalf. But secondly, the anointing is also a sign of that that Holy Spirit is upon me. And so when, when the prophet's saying that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me and he has anointed me, he's, he's talking about that the Spirit of God has chosen and empowered in this individual for a particular task. The interesting thing about this particular passage is, is that it's got multiple, like many prophecies, it's kind of got multiple layers of meaning. You know, it's, it's like an onion. You peel past the layer and there's another layer. You peel past the layer, there's another layer. So let me tell you some of the layers. First of all, this passage is about Isaiah and Israel. The, the most surface layer is, is that um, when Isaiah says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me and he has anointed me to preach, to proclaim, to do, basically saying the Messiah is coming, good news is coming, that the Lord is going to act for, he's again giving a message to a people who are in exile a people who needed hope, and he's going, hope is coming, and God has anointed me as a prophet to let you know that the good news is coming. And that's part, that's the first layer. That's how Jews for many, many years looked at this, this particular prophecy is going that, well, God, yeah, God told Isaiah to, to tell us this. So it's about Isaiah and Israel, but it's also about Jesus' earthly ministry. Because now we got Jesus in Luke 4 who's saying, well, this is about me. He's saying that the, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, Jesus is saying, and I am anointed to preach and to proclaim and to bring sight to the blind. And we look at Jesus' earthly ministry, that's what he did. He walked around preaching the gospel, treat preaching the good news of the kingdom. Okay, it's going on the right place on mine. It keeps jumping back. So it's about Isaiah and Israel. It's about Jesus' earthly ministry, but it's also about Jesus' redemptive ministry. See, it's about Jesus, when he says this prophecy is fulfilled today, he's not just saying, yeah, Isaiah went around preaching this good news, and I'm going to go around preaching the good news of God's kingdom and working some signs to authenticate my message. But what Jesus is actually saying is, I am the fulfillment of the good news. Now, what is that? All right, if, if, if I get a letter from someone that says, Charlie's ties are fantastic, but that's not what this is about. It says, Charlie has just inherited the entire estate of William Gates. Bill Gates has passed away. He's named Charlie as his sole heir. So whoever that lawyer was, was kind of like Isaiah. He's going, there's some good news here. Now, I could get that message, and I could say, Charlie, Bill Gates has passed away. You are the sole heir. That's kind of Jesus' earthly ministry. But then if I were to sit down and say, and I am the fulfillment, what I'm not saying at that point, I'm not just giving him the good news, I'm the check. See, I wouldn't say that because I'm not a check. But the fulfillment is the check. There's a difference between the good news, you're the sole heir of the William Gates you know, estate, and here's the check for every last cent of it. I don't know how much he's worth. I don't know what the check would be for. But you, you see the difference between the news and the fulfillment? Actually, the check wouldn't even be the fulfillment. In some ways, the check is a promise. Cashing the check and getting the cash, that's the fulfillment. In the same way, Jesus is saying, I'm not just the good news. I'm not even just the check. I'm the fulfillment. 
So when you're looking for good news, I'm not just telling you good news. I am the good news to the poor. I'm not just proclaiming freedom. I am freedom. I'm not just proclaiming or offering sight to the blind. I am sight to the blind. I am healing for the brokenhearted, depending whether you're going Hebrew, Greek, or, you know, we won't go back to that topic, though. But he's saying, I am the fulfillment of the prophet, of the promise. And this kind of blew people away. So it's about Isaiah and Israel, and, and it's about Jesus' earthly ministry, and it's about Jesus' redemptive ministry, and, but that's not all. It's about the ministry of the church. Not only is it about Isaiah and Israel and about Jesus as he walked the planet and about Jesus in all time and history, it's about you. Well, what what do I mean here? What am I talking about? The church is Jesus' hands and feet and mouth in our age. Jesus said to his disciples, it is better for you that I go. He's talking about his ascension after being crucified and resurrected. It's better for you that I go because if I go, I will send my spirit and you will do greater things than these. Wait, you mean we're going to do greater things than healing blind people? Yep. We're going to be doing greater things than, you know, wait, Jesus, so you're saying that we... Us, Peter. I mean, even Peter, John, I don't want to talk about James. You know, he's saying us, we're going to give sight to the blind and, and be good news to the poor, and, and we're going to heal brokenhearted, and, and we're going to uh, free the oppressed and, and free the captives. That, that's what we're going to be. He's like, yeah, that's what I'm calling you to do. I'm going up so I can send the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit of the Lord will be upon you And throughout the New Testament, we see that as a Christian, the Spirit of God is inside you. The Spirit. Does that ever, do you ever just stop and think about that for a moment? That the God that created the universe is inside you. All that power, all that wisdom, all of that is inside you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you, church, and you are anointed to preach the good news to the poor and to give sight to the blind and to set the captive free and to bring freedom to the oppressed. Because that's what Jesus came for. And when he left, he sent his spirit for us to do that. Oftentimes we talk about, well, I just can't seem to get into the Christmas spirit. Right? Right? Everyone, that's, I mean, it's Advent. We got to get into the Christmas spirit. And, and maybe I got I to I gotta listen to a little more Christmas music. If I listen to a little more Christmas music, then I'll get into the Christmas spirit. Or if I, if I eat a little more goodies, then I'll get into the Christmas spirit. No, then you'll get fat. Trust me, I've tried it. This is how this happens. And we try to do all these things to get into the Christmas spirit. What I submit to you this morning as we start Advent is maybe the Christmas spirit doesn't have a small s. Maybe the Christmas spirit has a large s. Maybe the Christmas spirit is the spirit of Lord Almighty who is called to be upon you, who is upon you, and that you're anointed. Maybe being in the Christmas spirit means for us to recognize the reality of Isaiah 61, that it's about me and it's about you, and that we're called not only this time of year, but certainly especially this time of year. I mean, if we can't, you want to get in the Christmas spirit? Proclaim the good news to the poor. You want to capture the Christmas spirit? Bring sight to the blind. But I don't know how to heal blind people. Pray for them anyway. There's, there's more than one kind of blindness. Sometimes God does heal physical blindness through us, but a lot of the times he heals spiritual blindness through us. He wants to heal spiritual blindness. 
He wants to, to minister to the poor. He wants to, to set people free who are captives, not just in jail, but are captives to a, a addictions or sin or you name it. He wants to set them free through you. Let that sink in for a moment. Say this with me. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me. That was pretty good. Now, try saying it like you believe it. As you say the words, I want you to Believe them. If you're a Christian, if you're not a follower of Christ, let's talk about it after because I want these words to be true about you. But if you're a follower of Christ, if you've said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and, and be my boss and I will follow you, then this is true about you. So, so let's say it again. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. But that's not all. It's also about Jesus' return as king and judge. This prophecy is not just about the first advent. It's not just about what Jesus did as he walked the earth. It's not just about what Jesus is doing through us. It's not about Jesus just being the fulfillment because we know that there are still, you know, captives and blind and oppressed, and those things still are on the earth even as much of a difference as we try to make, those still exist. But the day will come, the second advent will come when Jesus returns. And at that time, there will be no more captives. There will be no no more blindness. There will be no more poor or oppressed or all of that will be gone. And we look forward to that, don't we? So this prophecy has that layer too. And finally, because all those things are true, it should make a difference all year, but especially this time of the year. Is it making a difference in your life? Now, I know sometimes we go, Pastor Tom, you you don't get it. God couldn't possibly use me to open someone's eyes. God couldn't possibly use me to set a captive free. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Because when you say God couldn't possibly use me, you're saying more about what you believe about God than what you believe about you. God can and does use anyone. It doesn't matter how eloquent you are. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are. It doesn't matter how emotionally stable you are. It doesn't matter how physically healthy you are. God uses all kinds of people. God particularly likes to use broken people because he gets the glory when that happens. Karen shared a story. I don't know if I'm allowed to share this. I might not get through it. She definitely won't. Um, Her mom, most of you know, has Alzheimer's. At this point, you can't even have a conversation with her. She can't really put together an intelligible sentence. She loves the Lord. She's a follower of Jesus. And I guess the other week or sometime in the past month, I don't know exactly when it happened, but her dad told her this story. The, the, the head nurse was helping her mom in some way. And after the fact, he found out the head nurse is a Christian woman, apparently going through stuff in her life, uh, having a hard time. Um, and she was trying to help Karen's mom. And Karen's mom, I don't know, a moment of lucidity, but certainly the spirit used her. She took her hands and she looked into this woman's eyes and said, how long are you going to worry? And the woman just started crying. She felt like God had spoken directly to her heart through someone who can't speak. Don't tell me God can't use you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you, and he has anointed you. That's the Spirit of the season. Let's bow our heads.
What does your loving Heavenly Father want you to know today? What scripture, what comment, what thought do you feel like He's underlined in your heart today? Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And how will you cooperate with what He's doing in you and what He's doing through you? I'm just going to give you some moments of silence to reflect on that before I close us in prayer. Father, we're thankful for, for the fact that when your people Israel were in their darkest time, that you gave them this promise of hope. We thank you that that promise of hope through Jesus is available to all of us. We thank you that, that Jesus is the fulfillment of that, that in him we are free, and in him we see, and in him... We, we throw off those things that are crushing us down. Lord, we thank you that in that, that prophecy that we, we're included in that, not only as recipients, but as those who, who through the Holy Spirit, we are anointed to bring those things to the people in our lives who are oppressed and who are in captivity and who are blind who are broken. Use us, Lord. Open our eyes. Open our eyes past the de decorations and the songs. Open our eyes to those in our midst who are indeed poor, or captives, or oppressed, or hungry, or blind, or brokenhearted. May we be the blessing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.